But if you if you get your lunch, I'll go
thank you so much for coming, particularly at this time of the semester, which is very in its crunch time here. I really appreciate the terrific uh, turnout. Uh, now, in the answer the anthropology department, we tend to read our talks. I hope that's not um, too formal for this group. I hear that it's more extemporaneous here, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, today, I'm going to draw on my background as a political and legal anthropologist, a former employee of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation to help illuminate some of the issues that pertain to U.S. American Indian tribes and natural resources. Part of my work centers on 21st century conflicts over tribal natural resources, and more specifically, conflicts between Indians and non-Indians within tribal boundaries. In the second part of this talk, I'll provide an overview of two such conflicts. Uh, one involved Choctaw Timberlands, uh, the other Choctaw Water. Uh, first, though, a bit of background, uh, particularly for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with federal Indian law. Uh, conflicts over tribal natural resources, especially conflicts between Indians and non-Indians, cannot be understood without an understanding of the social and legal framework that helps structure these conflicts, a framework that renders American Indians significantly different from other minoritized populations uh, in the United States and from other Americans. Undergirding this framework is the concept of sovereignty and, and the reserved rights doctrine, the federal trust responsibility and the trust status of Indian land. American Indians, are uh, divided into 567 separate federally recognized tribal nations and a number of state recognized uh, tribal nations. Uh, different self-designations ex exist, uh, such as nation, tribe, uh, band, or pueblo, uh, but all federally recognized tribes are po political equivalents with the same legal status. Uh, each tribe is recognized as possessing sovereignty uh, which is most usefully conceptualized as a bundle of inherent powers or rights. The reserved rights doctrine holds that tribes have retained sovereignty over all powers or rights not explicitly taken away by treaty, by federal law, or by the U.S. Supreme Court. Such rights can include a property right, such as the right to fish, uh, the political, ro uh, political rights, such as the right to administer justice, uh, the legal construction of Indian tribes as nations with inherent sovereign powers is enshrined in treaties, the U.S. Constitution, federal Indian policy, federal law, and tribal law. By virtue of our sovereignty, tribes are entitled to, among other things, elect our own leaders, determine our own citizenries, maintain tribal uh, police forces, levy taxes, regulate property under tribal jurisdiction, control the conduct of our members by tribal ordinances, uh, regulate the domestic uh, relations of our members, administer justice, justice, and operate our own schools. Under the same set of founding American charters and all, come on in, Ben. Yeah, thanks for coming. Under the same set of founding American charters and laws, uh, the federal government has what is called the tr a trust responsibility toward Indian tribes. The federal government is legally obligated to, among other things, uh, protect, protect tribes against encroachments upon our sovereignty, protect tribal property, and foster conditions that permit tribes to more fully exercise our sovereignty. Failing to fulfill the federal trust responsibility is at times taken very seriously. One such failure of the federal government to protect Indian land initiated the largest class action lawsuit in U.S. history, uh, Cobell v. Salazar, that was settled with individual Indians in 2009 for $3.4 billion. A third component of the legal framework that is essential to understanding conflicts between Indians and non-Indians over natural resources within tribal boundaries is the legal status of Indian land. Most tribal lands are held in trust by the federal government on behalf of individual tribes. Tribal trust lands are understood as held in common by all tribal members of a particular tribe with tribal leaders or subgroups allocating use rights in those lands to individual members or to groups in a tribe. Tribal lands are governed by tribal governments and tribal law. 
with tribal leaders, tribal police, tribal courts, exercising jurisdiction over these lands. With some exceptions, federal and tribal laws, but not state laws, apply on Indian land. Importantly, as, is, as will be seen in the Choctaw Timberland case, tribal trust land can be sold, but only under certain limited conditions. A legitimate sale of tribal land is a sale that must be made uh, by a tribal leader with the consent of his or her people. Related, private property or government property can be acquired by a tribe or by the federal government on behalf of a tribe and converted into tribal trust land. With some exceptions, American Indian tribes have both surface and subsurface rights to their lands. Uh, tribal water rights uh, are a focus of the second conflict I'll discuss uh, today. Uh, the Winters v. U.S. Uh, decision in 1908 has been accurately described as, quote, the foundation of all Indian water law. The Winters decision states that tribes have reserved rights to water sufficient to develop and maintain vibrant growing economies on tribal homelands, even if this leaves non-Indians with little or no water. Subsequent case law has found that quote unquote sufficient water means at least enough water to service all PIA, or practicably irrigable acreage in a tribal homeland but that tribes may put their reserved water to any use that enhances the economic viability of their reservations. Tribal reserved rights to water are land-based. Uh, often they're implied in specific reservation creating treaties, as is the case with my tribe. When reservation water is insufficient, however, as is often the case in the arid Southwest, for example, Winter states that tribes have rights to water outside tribal boundaries. Two critical features of tribal reserved rights are that they are federally protected and they're not subject to state water law or state regulation. Before turning to the conflicts over Choctaw timber and Choctaw water, I'd like to say a few words about non-groundwater tribal subsurface resources. There is much misunderstanding and misinformation in, about this area of American Indian uh, tribal, uh, tribal natural resources. The percentages of tribally controlled fossil fuel reserves in the U.S. make tribes a significant player in national energy politics. In general, tribes have exclusive rights to the subsurface uh, resources of their lands, uh, tribal land is said to contain 30% of all the coal reserves in the U.S. west of the Mississippi, 20% uh, of all oil and gas reserves. In addition, in 1996, it was reported that tribal land contains 50% of all uranium reserves in the U.S. Uh, many tribes, uh, including my own tribe, have made natural resource extraction a part of their tribal economic development. Natural resource extraction serves as a source of revenue to fund the tribal government, uh, the operation of tribal government's uh, programs and services, job creation, uh, tribally owned and operated businesses. Tribes that extract fossil fuels such as coal, oil, and natural gas include, to list just a, a few examples, the Navajo Nation, Hopi Tribe, Osage Nation, Crow Tribe, Southern Ute Indian Tribe, three affiliated tribes, Creek Nation, and my own tribe. The heyday of coal mining uh, by my own tribe, however, has long passed. Uh, in the late 19th century, coal became one of the most important sources of Choctaw tribal revenue. In 1890, in fact, six towns in the Choctaw Nation were together the site of some of the heaviest coal production in the U.S. At that time, Choctaw tribal royalties, fees, and taxes on coal mining uh, totaled $90,000 per year, which is $2.3 million in 2017 dollars. And there were more than 15,000 Choctaw men uh, who worked as coal miners in the Choctaw Nation. Well, some of those were non-Choctaw, some of those were Choctaw, 15,000 coal miners. Today, the business that generates the most revenue uh, for the Choctaw Nation uh, is gaming. The Choctaw Nation has eight casinos, uh, including the casino resort pictured here. Uh, our tribal homeland, which is also pictured here, spans 10,864 square miles. 
As a consequence of allotment legislation in 1898, which uh, will be explained later, today only part of our 10,864 square mile tribal homeland is tribal trust land. Uh, this is going to be important uh, in a bit when I talk about Choctaw timberlands. But back to fossil fuels for just a minute. <laughs> um, for decades, coal has been the backbone of the economy of the Navajo Nation uh, and other tribes, such as the Crow tribe. Uh, in fact, half of the Crow tribe's 2017 <clears throat> non federal budget comes from their reservation's 40 year old Absaloka coal mine, which is pictured right here. Um, and this supplies Minnesota's largest power plant. Oil is an important part of the economies of a number of tribes uh, headquartered in what is now Alaska and Oklahoma. Uh, in the late 1990s, Inupiaq leader ben Brenda E. Tali explained, quote, no one should dictate policy over our own natural resources. We have no other economy except oil. We're headed toward economic depression if there is no more oil development. We don't want to go back. So we never want to go back to being wards of the federal government or a welfare society, end quote. While there is much support in Indian country for the continued use of fossil fuels as an energy source, there's also much opposition. For example, since the 1970s, the Northern Cheyenne tribe has refused to mine their substantial coal reserves. If the tribe was to mine coal, explained the president of the tribe, L.J.'s Killsback, earlier this month, we'd be contradicting what our ancestors stood for. We'd be contradicting the reason why the creator made us, end quote. A forestry official of the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation, a picture here, Louis Pitt, has added, quote, the whole idea of natural resource extraction is opposed to our Indian ways. Being Indian, means that you stay home and take care of your people and that you're not out to max profits, end quote. Protesters of the plan to route the Dakota Access Pipeline just north of the Standing Rock uh, Reservation have also expressed opposition to U.S. dependency on fossil fuels. Clearly, Indian country is divided, as is the rest of America, on the controversial issue of whether to engage in extraction, a uh, continued extraction of uh, fossil fuels. So now let me turn to the two 21st century conflicts between Indians and non-Indians over Choctaw tribal resources. Uh, the first conflict uh, involved uh, more than a million acres of Choctaw timberlands. Uh, the second, Choctaw War. Both of these cases illustrate the ways the federal government often breaches its trust responsibility toward tribes, specifically its responsibility to protect tribes against encroachments upon our sovereignty and to protect tribal property. Related, both cases illustrate the fact that the respect the federal government gives to tribal sovereignty is inconsistent. American Indians cannot and do not count on the federal government to respect tribal sovereignty. <laughs> long before tribal leaders take office, they know that countless times they will be called upon to defend the sovereignty of their tribe, and that this will, in fact, be one of the most important jobs uh, that they have as a tribal leader. Finally, both cases help expose the complexity of the social, culture, and cultural and historical context within which conflicts between Indians and non-Indians over tribal natural resources unfold. Regarding this complexity, it is unfortunately for us the case that uh, American Indian tribes exercise their sovereignty in a larger national context over which a more powerful centralized federal government also exercises sovereign powers, as do 50 subnational or state governments. Whether at the local, regional, national, or international level, tribes exercise their sovereignty in political arenas defined by overlapping and competing sovereignties. The conditions of multiple and overlapping sovereignties in the U.S. help explain the fact that even when certain tribal rights, such as Choctaw tribal water rights, appear legally well established, the exercise of such rights is often not a fait accompli for tribes. Instead, it is very often the case that tribes must negotiate their right to exercise these rights. Uh, rights which become, in the negotiation process, simply rights claimed. 
Uh, it is only after and through processes of negotiation with the federal and state governments that tribes are able to legitimately exercise certain of their rights. Um, and moreover, in the end, these rights may or may not bear resemblance to the rights that inhere in federal case law, federal law, treaties. Tribal governments tend to frame such processes of negotiating their rights as uh, processes through which their pre-existing rights are merely affirmed. Uh, Non-Indian uh, American governments, especially the state governments, as we shall see in the Choctaw Water case, sometimes view such processes as processes through which tribes acquire new rights. Indian tribes in the United States are not alone in having to negotiate certain aspects of their sovereignty. All nations must and do negotiate uh, their sovereignty. Uh, critical aspects of sovereignty is that for the most part it cannot simply be claimed. It is a product in part of processes of negotiation. So now let me get to the uh, timber case. Uh, from 2013 through 2015, I worked for the Chickasaw and Choctaw Nations as an expert in the case, the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nation versus the U.S. Department of the Interior. My job was to render opinions based on anthropological research I had conducted around the sale of Chickasaw and Choctaw tribal lands that had been reserved from allotment during a critical event in my tribe's history, the implementation of the Curtis Act of 1898. The Curtis Act was the Indian Territory, now Oklahoma version, of the General Allotment Act of 1887, a law that Teddy Roosevelt described as, quote, a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass, end quote, and to assimilate in Indians into the larger non-Indian society. Uh, this act allotted most of our homelands, homelands held in common, two individual tribal members, uh, including my grandfather, who was actually an infant at the time, uh, his parents and his siblings. Much of the Choctaw Nation's so-called surplus land was sold with the proceeds dis dispersed in payments to each tribal member. Some tribal lands were reserved from allotment. Uh, what has been called our reserved lands included 1.3 million acres of tribal timberlands, and more than 400,000 acres of uh, lands that were rich in coal and asphalt. Most of this acreage was held jointly by my tribe and our sister tribe, the Chickasaw Nation. Given that most uh, tribal land claims cases involve a single tribe as a plaintiff, why did these two tribes sue together? Uh, because we hold much acreage jointly, a reflection of our long history of interrelatedness. One of our origin stories uh, traces the emergence of the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations as a single people from a mound called Naniwa. Uh, picture right, or that's where it is, and this is a, a photo of it. Uh, after our emergence from the mound, we divided into the two tribes. A second tribal origin story traces a great migration of the Choctaw and Chickasaw people from what is now Mexico over, not, uh, over here to Naniwea, where we then divided uh, into uh, uh, two tribes. Uh, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, centuries later, in 1837, before leaving Indian Territory on the Trail of Tears, the Chickasaws chose to politically assimilate into the Choctaw Nation. As the first tribe targeted in the ethnic cleansing of the American South in the early 19th century, the Choctaws had relocated to Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, in 1830. 18 years later, after the Chickasaws became Choctaw Nation citizens, they seceded, citing unfair treatment by the numerically, politically, and culturally dominant Choctaws. And the Chickasaws reestablished themselves as a separate sovereign nation in 1855. Many of, my, of us, myself included, are of both Choctaw and Chickasaw ancestry, and our families span both tribes. Today, females with Choctaw and Chickasaw ancestry are frequently called Choc Chicks. <laughs> and today, the dominant tribe in Oklahoma, which is a state with 37 American Indian tribes, is the Chickasaw Nation. 
My research expert report and testimony in the Chickasaw Choctaw case uh, revolved around the fact that Harry J.W. Belvin, who served as Choctaw chief for 26 years in the mid 20th century, sold portions of our reserved lands. During my eight hour deposition with lawyers from the Department of Justice and the Department of the Interior, uh, a focus of discussion was problems with the sale of these lands, namely that they violated US federal standards for the sale of tribal land. The sale of tribal land in the U.S. is generally considered legitimate if it meets certain requirements, including that the sale must be made by a representative of the tribe, that it must be also be made with the consent of his or her people. Tribal land, remember, is understood as held in common by tribal members. One of my arguments in this case was that sales of our reserved timberlands were illegitimate in part because they were not sold by a representative of the tribe. To explain, uh, the Curtis Act of 1898 not only privatized much of our land, but also eviscerated our tripartite tribal government and part of the, as part of the whole goal of um, being a mighty pulverizing machine to break up the tribal mass. Uh, most of our leaders were removed from office and most of our tribal court records and other tribal government records were impounded. The US government installed a Choctaw chief to quote unquote settle the tribal estate as they put it. For 72 years from the passage of our allotment legislation through 1970, we Choctaws were not allowed to select our own chief. The US president appointed our chief. As I explained to the lawyers of the US government during my deposition, even though Chief Harry J.W. Belvin was indeed a Choctaw and thus could have served as a legitimate representative of our tribe, the fact that he was a U.S. presidential appointee made him an extension of the U.S. government. As a presidential appointee, Belvin was accountable to and answerable to the federal government, not the Choctaw people. Correspondence that I uncovered between Belvin and the BIA and the Department of the Interior in the archival record strongly supported my claim that for the more than two decades that Belvin served at, as Choctaw chief at the pleasure of the US government, he is best described as a representative of the US government, not of the Choctaw nation. A second related reason that the sale of timberlands was illegitimate is because the sale was not made with the consent of the Choctaw people. I interviewed numerous Choctaws who had lived through this period of Choctaw history. And the first thing I found is that Belvin enjoyed tremendous popularity throughout the Choctaw Nation. Many described him as personable and affable. They reported that he seemed to know nearly every Choctaw by name, and he spent many hours going door to door visiting Choctaws in their homes. Many Choctaws told me he showed a lot of affection for his people that he cared deeply about his tribe. As might be expected, however, there were some Choctaws with whom Belvin did not get along. Uh, some of his opponents even described him as a, quote, semi-dictator. And it was widely known that he paid much less attention to the tribe's youth, uh, particularly the 20-somethings, uh, than he did to the category he referred to as the older Choctaws. Clearly, what endeared many people, uh, many Choctaws to Belvin was his sensitivity to the tribe's endemic poverty and joblessness. These problems were quite serious during Belvin's tenure as a presidentially appointed chief. In 1969, for example, the BIA sounded an alarm about Choctaw unemployment in one Choctaw Nation county, describing it as critical. Uh, in 1970, Choctaw unemployment throughout the Choctaw Nation was more than twice the state average in Oklahoma. Belvin promised Choctaws that he would bring them economic relief. By that time, 20th century Choctaws had become accustomed to receiving payments from the sale of our so-called surplus lands, and these lands are distinct from our reserve lands. By 1925, uh, each Choctaw, including my grandfather and great-grandparents, had received 12 payments, in, uh, totaling $1,070 from the sale of tribal land. Belvin lost little time selling portions of the Chickasaw and Choctaw Reserve lands, lands that lay at the center of the lawsuit for which I served as an expert for the two tribes. 
At the same time, Belvin continued to work with the executive branch of the U.S. government to create and carry out a much larger, and as it turned out, really sinister plan. A plan that would bring to each individual Choctaw a very large payment. With lawmakers who represented the state of Oklahoma and the House of Representatives and the Senate in Washington, D.C., Belvin helped craft legislation to authorize his plan and its implementation. And the plan was a plan to dissolve the Choctaw Nation. This was a long-standing goal of the U.S. government and an objective of federal Indian policy at the time, a policy called termination. Had Belvin's plan been carried out and the law was repealed uh, shortly before it was to take effect, within minutes, I think, or maybe even as much as an hour, all Choctaw tribal assets would have been liquidated and distributed to Choctaw tribal members, yielding a large payment for each Choctaw, and the legal status of all individual Choctaws would have been changed from Indian to non-Indian. Choctaws whom I interviewed said that Belvin was the only leader, Indian or non-Indian, who spoke to the Choctaw people about this law, which was referred to as Belvin's Law when I was interviewing Choctaws about it. Interviews revealed that Belvin spoke only of the economic relief it would provide. He said nothing about the law being a termination law. I could locate no Choctaw who claimed that Belvin had told them that their economic relief would come at the cost of their continued existence as American Indians. And I could find no Choctaw that who said that they supported the then current policy of uh, federal termination, tribal termination by the federal government. When I spoke to Choctaw Charles Brown shortly before his death in the late 1990s, I learned that after Belvin had learned the truth, uh, after Brown had learned the truth about Belvin's law, he led a major anti-termination movement in Oklahoma a movement that led to, what is the direct uh, cause of the repeal of the termination law shortly before it was to go into effect. A number of Choctaws corroborated Mr. Brown's story and many participated in the protests. I also learned that prior to the anti-termination movement, Belvin had assured his federal superiors that Choctaw support and approval for his plan was very widespread. He had assured them that the sale of Choctaw timberlands and the proposed liquidation of all other tribal assets did indeed have the consent of the Choctaw people. While the protest movement came too late to save much of the tribal timberlands from being sold, it did foil Belvin's plan and the federal government's plan to dissolve the Choctaw Nation. Having established with archival evidence, especially Belvin's correspondence with his superiors in the Department of the Interior, that Belvin was not a representative of the Choctaw people, but rather an extension of the U.S. government, and having established that there exists no evidence that the Choctaw people consented to the sale of any portion of our reserved lands or other assets, but instead that we were united in opposing tribal termination, it was clear that the sale of our timberlands violated federal standards for the legitimate sale of tribal lands. After my many hours of testimony with lawyers representing the U.S. <coughs> government, I drove home and hoped for the best. The Chickasaw and Choctaw Nations had retained five law firms and hired about a half dozen experts, including me, for this case. Six months after my deposition, I was pleased to hear from the lawyers that the two tribes had reached a negotiated settlement with the U.S. government. On October 6, 2015, Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell announced that the U.S. government had agreed to pay the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations $186 million. She added that 100 tribes, additional tribes, were in similar settlement negotiations with the federal government. My reaction to the settlement was mixed. <clears throat> I was elated that my tribe and our sister tribe were receiving compensation for the illegitimate sale of much of our timberlands, but I found it difficult to shake a feeling of sadness and loss. The feelings were connected to a conversation I had had with two of the tribe's lawyers on April 14, 2013, which was the day of my deposition. One of the lawyers, Deanna Hartley, uh, herself a Chickasaw, vividly described to me the lands that were then being considered for return to us as part of a proposed settlement of the suit. Excitement infused her voice. 
Now, we both knew that early in the 20th century, huge swaths of southeastern Oklahoma forests had burned and been cut over. Deanna gushed. There were tracks that were under consideration for return to us, tracks with rolling hills covered in pine and oak pine forests and dotted with ash and walnut trees. These tracks, she added, have been recovering nicely from their 20th century traumas, just like our tribes were. After the settlement was announced, I felt wistful and somewhat disappointed because no land had been returned. My preference was for a return at least of at least some of the more than one million acres of lands that had been stripped from us and that were at issue in this case. The water conflict. For a period spanning more than two decades, uh, I have been researching a still unresolved uh, Choctaw water rights conflict, uh, seeking to document and analyze the perspectives of different categories of actors and entities. When I initiated this uh, exploration in the 1990s, the conflict was a topic of much conversation in the Choctaw Nation. Choctaws discussed it often in restaurants, tribal businesses, churches, their homes, and elsewhere. At the time, a consortium of municipal governments based in Texas that included the cities of Dallas and Fort Worth had announced that they would pay $400 million for 130 million gallons of water per day from the Choctaw tribal homelands and from the neighboring Chickasaw Nation for 100 years. In this poverty-stricken area, the Texas offer garnered attention. Last summer brought a similar spike in Choctaw citizen interest in Choctaw water, which by that point had become very closely linked to Chickasaw water. Emboldened by the fact that the state had reached a preliminary agreement with the two tribes that included an arrangement to convey Choctaw water to Oklahoma City, this was last summer, Oklahoma City Manager uh, Jim Couch announced that in 2018, Oklahoma City will begin a pipeline extension project to pipe water uh, from Lake Sardis to Oklahoma City, well actually to an intermediate point between here and uh, there in Oklahoma City. The price tag of the project, he reported, will be, quote, in the $1 billion range. Most tribal water rights conflicts in the U.S. involve conditions of water scarcity. In contrast, this involves what many argue is a surplus of water. Most such conflicts are about tribal efforts to secure sufficient water to pursue tribal economic development and thereby make tribal homelands viable and vibrant. In the Choctaw uh, and Chickasaw water case too, Tribal water rights, frequently called winter's rights, have been and continue to be pursued for economic development. But the proposed water use differs from most other tribal water conflicts. The primary use to which the two tribes expect to put the water is water leasing, or also called water marketing, or simply selling the water. Law professor in Cherokee, Tiawagi Helton, describes water leasing as both groundbreaking and a tribal sovereignty assertion that is of broad significance for tribes. Quote, the marketing of water is one of the most important aspects of the reserved rights doctrine today, he has explained. The Choctaw Nation's water rights claims are based in the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, the treaty that authorized the forced removal of our tribe from what was then Indian Territory, or to what was then Indian Territory, now Oklahoma. This 19th century treaty affirms Choctaw ownership and control over all the water within the tribe's boundaries and is the bedrock of most Choctaw discussions of the conflict. Tribal water rights, as many Indians are quick to point out, exist outside of state water law. In this connection, oddly, they are classed or treated like federal property rights and as Helton has pointed out, quote, are generally paramount to rights perfected under state systems. The treaty-based Choctaw claims to the water seriously undermine Oklahoma's claims to the water, as does Oklahoma state water law itself, which has been characterized in the literature as, quote, in disarray, as a result of its legal history of attempted re reconciliations of the riparian and prior appropriation systems that tried to, tried to, okay, taking both halves of the states, which 
were governed by two sets of water laws and tried to marry those two together. Uh, interviews with non-Indian Oklahomans revealed that Oklahoma's claims to the state, to the water, revolve around uh, the Sardis Lake Reservoir, pictured here in the first two uh, pictures, uh, the top two pictures. Uh, this is a project that some Choctaws have condemned as a violation of Choctaw tribal sovereignty. Sardis Lake Reservoir was built in the 1970s by the Army Corps of Engineers in the Choctaw homeland, which the federal Indian policy of allotment had transformed into a patchwork of Indian and non-Indian land. Oklahoma leaders and lawmakers argue that by contracting with the Corps to build the reservoir, Oklahoma's efforts to mitigate the state's water problems justify Oklahoma control over Choctaw water. My research into the state's water problems uh, affirmed the existence of significant water problems. Oklahoma's western half, which lies in the American Great Plains and is blanketed by mixed prairie grass, gets too little water, as little as 16 inches per year, and that's just the beginning of their water problems, uh, resulting in uh, severe problems of drought, while eastern Oklahoma, which is covered with timber and forms the easternmost swath of the eastern woodland region of the United States, gets way too much water, uh, as much as 56 inches of rain per year. The water project uh, that was designed primarily to help control flooding in southeastern Oklahoma and secondarily to help capture water that could be sent to thirsty western Oklahoma, or the metropole as it turns out later, um, this uh, structure spans uh, 13,600 acres, 15 by 8 miles at its broadest. It's 117 miles of shoreline defined it, define an intricate network of inlets and peninsulas that, have, that helped make the structure the 2001 top bass tournament fishing lake in the state. Sardis Reservoir was created by a rolled earth fill dam that is 14,138 feet long and rises 81 feet from a valley floor to a maximum depth of 101 feet. Interviews with Oklahoma leaders, Choctaw leaders, Army Corps of Engineers staff, uh, who were conveniently located uh, just one floor down from where I worked at the BIA, and Choctaw citizens who were living near the reservoir, exposed much about the water project's construction in the 1970s and early 1980s. Interviews and archival research turned up no evidence that the federal government or the state of Oklahoma had consulted with the Choctaw Nation at any point during the construction. The reservoir was not built on tribal land, uh, but because it was built on land that lay within the boundaries of the Choctaw Nation, it was incumbent upon the Army Corps of Engineers especially, but also the state of Oklahoma, to at least consult with and gain the consent of the Choctaws prior to the project's construction. Failing to do so violates the federal trust responsibility toward tribes. The prospect of impounding Choctaw water considerably strengthened this imperative, not simply suggesting, but mandating the negotiation of a tribal state agreement prior to the construction. The federal government's ongoing failure to protect and defend Choctaw water rights and thus meet their federal obligation to do so, together with continued uncertainty over how exactly allotment has impacted state water rights, have provided an opening for the state of Oklahoma to claim control of Choctaw and now also Chickasaw water. I was dismayed to find a culture in which Oklahoma leaders and state water board employees whom I interviewed steadfastly refused to acknowledge the existence of Choctaw water rights. For example, more than two decades after the reservoir was built, Dwayne Smith, executive director of the state agency that manages Oklahoma water, publicly asserted that the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations have, quote, no legal claim to the natural resources, end quote. About Choctaw water rights more specifically, he told reporters, quote, we don't believe that claim is valid. In the state's negotiation with the two tribes, however, the state has implicitly acknowledged tribes' winter's rights. For example, the 2001 draft settlement agreement, which was later abandoned, uh, 
in that agreement, the state agreed to a deal in which the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations would receive half the revenues from leasing water to Texas. Citizen opinion in the Choctaw Nation was divided about whether to convey water from Sardis Reservoir to the metropoles of Dallas, Fort Worth, or Oklahoma City on the one hand, or on the other, to keep the water in the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nation. Many rural Choctaws supported a large-scale water lease to a metropole for the much-needed capital it would bring to the tribes. Capital, supporters explained, that could be used to improve and expand Indian education, tribal services, and job creation. Others argued that the water should remain in our tribal homelands to grow manufacturing, industry, retail, and other businesses, as well as to create jobs, not in urban areas, but rather in our own tribal homelands. Sending the water to the city, supporters of this position explained, is sending economic development to the city. And more development in the city will likely accelerate the already massive outmigration of Indian youth from tribal homelands. This outmigration is one of the Choctaw Nation's most vexing problems. Such debates about the fate of Choctaw and Chickasaw water continue to rage in the cow pastures and courthouses of Oklahoma as the now more than 40 year conflict continues to unfold. This talk has sketched uh, two conflicts over tribal natural resources within tribal homelands. The Timberlands case, resolved in 2015 by a payment to the Chickasaw and Choctaw nations of $186 million, was a conflict with the federal government. In contrast, the still unresolved water rights case is a conflict with a state government. A truism in Indian country is that Indians fare better in conflicts with the federal government than they do in conflicts with state governments. Regarding state abuses against tribes, legal scholar Sharon O'Brien notes that often such conflicts display one or more of the following characteristics. Ignorance concerning tribal rights, jealousy over tribal resources, and prejudice against Indians. My research revealed that unfortunately all three characteristics have shaped the conflict uh, between Oklahoma and the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nation. In addition, it is likely that the two tribes will take legal action against the federal government, which has failed to meet its trust responsibility to protect tribal water from encroachment by the state of Oklahoma. Presuming that my former employer, the BIA, will then intervene to protect and defend Choctaw and Chickasaw water rights against the state of Oklahoma, uh, as the federal government through the BIA is obligated to do, it is highly unlikely that the BIA will succeed in helping secure for the two tribes their full water rights. First, tribal water rights expert Lloyd Burton has accurately described Indian water settlements as uh, quote unquote haphazard, situation specific, and unpredictable, end quote, uh, almost regardless of the strength of the case or the manner in which it is settled uh, by negotiation, litigation, or administrative decree. Tribal water rights expert Daniel McCool adds that U.S. water legislation more generally is, quote, typically piecemeal and ad hoc, and water development and administration is disjointed, reflecting a non-Indian American policymaking process characterized by iron triangles, distributive politics, log rolling, and vote trading. This has exacerbated the problems tribes have faced in obtaining the water to which they are entitled. And then finally, there exists a history of harm done to Indian tribes when the federal government has built federal projects like water projects like the Sardis Reservoir in or near Indian country. This history militates against an expectation that the outcome of the Choctaw and Chickasaw water conflict will be beneficial to Indians. Now, when I sketch this conflict today, I sort of uh, hinted at the flooding that took place, well, as you all know, from the building of dams and reservoirs. A different core reservoir, this took place in Sardis uh, Reservoir, a different core reservoir, also built in the late, uh, late 20th century, pictured in the upper left corner, flooded as many as 10,000 acres of the Allegheny Reservation of the Seneca Nation, leaving only 2,300 acres flat enough for use and forcing the relocation of one-third of the reservation's citizens. 
The BOR built Navajo Dam in the lower left of the screen, flooded two Navajo towns, then led to the passage of a resolution that accorded Navajos only 50,000 acre feet of Colorado River water per year, when their rightful entitlement is at least 2 million acre feet per year. A third example is the Pixong Missouri Basin uh, program, which authorized the construction in the mid 20th century of 107 dams by both the Corps and the BOR and is referenced in the third picture. This massive water program flooded one fourth of the Fort Berthold Reservation of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes and destroyed thousands of additional acres on five different Sioux reservations. One third of the residents on these Sioux reservations were forced to relocate and nearly 90% of these tribes' timberland, 75% of their wild game, and their best agricultural lands were flooded. A bright spot in the dark history of dispossession of American Indian land, water, and other resources in this country is the determination of American Indian people to protect and defend our remaining tribal natural resources. Uh, particularly in the face of so many devastating losses of these resources. As became clear in the conflicts over land and water I described today, these efforts take place in a contemporary context in which assaults on our tribal resources continue to occur. Uh, and this reality is not well known. In our recent post-removal, post-allotment tribal history, we Choctaws have been robbed of more than a million acres of timberland, through a sinister federal plan that involved the co-optation of one of our leaders and a failed attempt to dissolve our tribe. We achieved some justice in the negotiated settlement of 2015, but disappointingly, these stolen lands are still not back in our hands. Some of the legal tools for which we fought so hard during the colonial period and early American period still prove useful today, as I hope this talk has helped illustrate. These include treaties, such as the Choctaw's Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek, the bundle of inherent rights or powers, that is tribal sovereignty, uh, winters, water rights, the federal trust responsibility, and the legal status of tribal land. I remain somewhat hopeful. <laughs> interesting to hear the story and there are a lot of things about in that story that I didn't know before like that the Chickasaws and the Choctaws had at one time uh, merged in Oklahoma but just to sort of zoom out a bit it just seems to me that so you've got these three different kinds of sovereign entities you've got the federal government mm -hmm. you've got the tribe and you've got the state of Oklahoma or any state and it sounds I mean it's my impression that a lot of this is really kind of like um, um, a negotiation or a fight over the balance of power among those three kinds of entities. And so, it, just from listening to your story and just from other things I've heard, it seems to me that over the last 60 or 70 years, that balance has shifted a lot and that, mm -hmm. and that the tribes have gained a lot more power relative to the federal government than used to be the case. And my question is, A, is that perception true, and B, if it is true, what is it that led to that shift? Is it changes in federal law? Is it things that happen in the courts? Or is it just purely the sort of playing out of a political process of this sort of constant negotiation? Wow, that is a, a good big question. Uh, I do think things are on the upswing uh, for tribes. Um, I, and I feel that it is due to a number of different um, transformations that have occurred. Uh, with respect to tribal water rights, that Winters decision uh, in 1908 was absolutely critical. You know, and so, so much of what's been going on since then uh, hinges on, on Winters. Uh, I also feel that, so that would be you know, uh, litigation. Uh, I also feel that uh, tribes um, are, Doing, th they have more money, like the Choctaw Nation with that, you know, largest casino. So we were able to hire five law firms um, and uh, extra, a whole ream of experts uh, to help 
uh, make our case. Uh, that has helped a lot. You know, money speaks, as you well know, <laughs> in the um, in the legal arena in particular. Uh, we have more educated uh, tribal members. We have more non-Indians who are supportive and who are allies, including all those lawyers who lined up uh, against us. I mean, with us, uh, <laughs> as well as those who are against us. I mean, those there were those on both sides. Um, so I think, um, I also think that there are ways that tribes are positioning themselves that uh, today, well, I'll just talk about my tribe in particular, that is help, helping fuel a transformation. So uh, one example is that uh, my tribe, the Choctaw Nation, has invested a lot of money in our healthcare system. Uh, it, so it's a top-notch healthcare system, whereas the rest of America is just under this failing you know, healthcare system. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, have entertained the idea and sort of extended that healthcare system to non-Indian people in the area so that they can come to the tribal hospital, to the tribal clinics, which are the top-notch clinics, medical facilities, and receive uh, high-quality medical care at very low cost. And so this helps tie them, tie them into the future of the Choctaw Nation and helps mobilize support for Choctaw tribal water rights. Also, we have 6,000 employees of the Choctaw Nation today. Lots of non-Indians in the area working for the Choctaw Nation. Those people feel more closely tied and loyal. their loyalty is more closely aligned with the Choctaw Nation than it is with the state of Oklahoma. So this helps give us a, so some political muscle. So, so it's really been political and sort of torts and more than just you know some change in federal law. I mean, I'm, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was interested in the, the tribal um, timber sales. Yes. And it exposes this connection between land and sovereignty that hadn't really occurred to me before, but. It seems like the two are inextricably linked. So, so true. And what is, is there such a thing as sovereignty without land? I, I, it's hard for me to answer that um, because, because I'm too close to this material. Let me throw it back to you. Okay. What do you think? <laughs> well, they seem like separate things. It seems like there's land and there's sovereignty, which is more in the realm of ideas. Right. And land is a physical thing. But I I can't really think of them separate. I think there are tribes, aren't there tribes in the East that really don't have much in the way of tribal rights? Yes. They and yet they have sovereignty, they have legal okay. sovereignty. So. Okay. That is true. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but it, it becomes very difficult uh -huh. to uh, fully exercise your sovereignty when you have no land base. And, and there are, that's a, that's a thank you for helping me out there. So do you think uh, cases like uh, with the Timberland, so winning that case or settling that case, does that help other nations or do each of these nations have to kind of go about their own, you know, disputes with the government without this helping or, or hurting or in any way? Wow, great question. Um, the way that we tend to uh, go about um, Addressing our claims is a separate tribe. So this is very unusual that we have a Choctaw and Chickasaw jointly sued. Um, and we see our interests as very separate and very tribally specific. Um, so, you know, the, the impetus for the action that we take legally is not to help other tribes. We're trying to help ourselves. At the same time, we understand that in the end, all the precedents that are set by successful tribes do help us, and it helps other tribes. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say how interesting your talk is, and thank you for coming again. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, um, so you said a lot of the land um, in the, what is it, the 2015 settlement was not returned back to uh, the tribe. None of it. Yeah, so yeah. what... How, like what how has that land been used has it been developed on like do you know what has happened to that land see and, some like, of who the, owns it stuff like that there are some that was one of the topics of the conversation that i had with deanna hartley and that was part of the problem how do you go about 
resting control of privately owned property. Mm -hmm. <laughs> big, big issue. And very messy and you know, people want to avoid that. Now a lot of those or some of those tracks were um, were government, you know, forest land. So that could have been returned without too much difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, but then uh, more of it was private. Okay. So yeah, it was a, it was a, a mix. Good, good question. Yeah. 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 Just been thinking about you know, not only timbers and resources and the land, but also the water. I guess I kind of see maybe the future is there's more of these complex coming to people. You know, that stage just because. We've Water, you know, scarcity, you know, climate change, and things like that. So I'm just curious about your outlook. Maybe thinking, I don't know, over the next 30, 40 years, are things going to be hopefully more successful for individual nations and tribes, or is that? Boy, I hope so. I really hope so. When I got, when I was hired in 2013 for the timber case, I was very pessimistic. I did not think that, I did not dream in a million years actually that we would have the outcome that we have. I realized I was disappointed that we didn't have the land return, but we still got $186 million for that, a significant settlement. I think that's the fifth largest tribal land settlement in U.S. history. Uh, so that was a surprise, you know, an unexpected victory. And I think it's important to approach these kinds of conflicts um, with a cautious optimism, because uh, if you look in the literature, if you go through the you know, case law, these, these kinds of cases, there are so many examples that are so hard to wrap your mind around as to how the outcome was reached. Like the one, I think the one with the, why the Navajos got only 50,000 acre feet of Colorado water yeah. per year. That, is, that, I don't understand how that happened. Yeah. Um, now that uh, that is going to okay. So that uh, runs to the end uh, or December 2019 is when the end of that contract or so that agreement is. So that will be renegotiated in December 2019. So the Navajos will then have that opportunity to um, to obtain more <laughs> their, their rightful share, their right. two million million acres. Now the state of Arizona has two million acre feet of that water. So, I mean, this is going to be really interesting to see that happen. The Navajos will benefit from uh, the whatever happens yeah, in these other cases. So, they're sort of watching. Yeah. And then I guess my follow up question is um, you know that there's a lot that goes into coming up with settlement that all yes. parties end up agreeing to, if they do or do not. But um, I guess, do you have just a kind of overview of the list of the experts that are like, how do you, how do you determine, okay, you only get one point or you know, however many millions of dollars, or how many acre feet of a river? Um, that just how, is that, how is that determined? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question. The lawyers. The lawyers have it out. Yeah, the lawyers have it out. Yeah. And in the, the case of the uh, the Timberlands, mm -hmm. yeah, that was our lawyers, Chickasaw and Choctaw Nation, who hired lawyers against Department of the of Justice, Department of the Interior, lawyer, just going back and forth, and Secretary of the Interior, Sally Sure. And how they came up with that, I don't know. Now, I had a really, you know, I loved being within the Bureau of Indian Affairs in part because I could see how these deals are made and how things uh, work themselves out, and it's so interesting being, being able to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers and just you know, just fish and wildlife and everybody was there in the Department of the Interior Building, Main Interior Building, um, but I'm still puzzled and baffled <laughs> by how a lot of these things get resolved and how they unfold. Okay. Oh, okay. One last question. Okay. Um, that the issues that um, generally speaking, um, the tribes can better in the negotiation or conflict with the federal government than the state government. Is it likely do you think that the current administration in Washington that more of these conflicts and issues will be devolved to the states, which the big implications for trials that will be Yes, I mean everything will be worse uh, for tribes under Trump. I mean that that is a given. However, uh, tribes came out, almost every tribe came out in support of Neil Gorsuch. They felt that he 
very knowledgeable about Indian law, very supportive of uh, tribal rights, including some of those that I brought up. Uh, so it's all, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, and and uh, we have uh, two American Indians who are currently uh, serving together, the 535 members of the House of Representatives and Senate together. There are only two American Indians. Both of them are Republican, Tom Cole of the Chickasaw Nation and Mark Wayne Mullen of the Cherokee Nation. So we're not, um, I mean, to sort of anticipate, you know, we're not necessarily in a, you know, Republicans um, are a base of support, uh, as well as Democrats, but uh, there's a lot of traction that can be gained, and we just have a pretty anti-Indian president right now, and that's going to take take some doing to work around. But there are a lot of allies uh, that uh, the tribes have, including members of, of Congress. Well, thank you so much, Molly. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, we hope you can still do. Yeah. Uh, we hope you can join us for a happy hour, continue these conversations with Valerie, and have a Do you have any particular questions? Linda, yeah, I so maybe you would like to join the archaeology bar. Are you guys going to have a Okay, I should go home. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's hang out in the Stay Yeah, you did.